Okay, uh, we have a very, I think, full agenda and I wanna hope that you'll find interesting. Before we get started, just wanna make sure that the board members present step forward and introduce yourselves uh, to the rest of our, to the rest of our crew. I'm Denise Stevens, I'm chair of the board, uh, Dean of University Libraries, University of Oklahoma. Any other board members present? Um, I'm Jenny Lee. I am a longtime member of the board at DPLA and um, uh, am run a literary studio called Plumpton where we do a lot of uh, innovative projects in publishing, including with a lot of libraries like NYPL and others. Thank you. Mute. And Denise, I know we're waiting on a couple more folks, but I know one person got stuck in travel okay. and one person sent me a note saying that they're dealing with an emergency at their library. So as they come in, um, the team will make sure we, we flag Thank folks you. and give them heads up. Fabulous. Well, in that case, um, we look forward to today's session and John, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, welcome everyone. I, Extra appreciation for everyone here on a one of the first warm Sunday, uh, Friday Sundays, summer summer Fridays. Uh, we we're recording this because we know a lot of folks aren't able to join us live uh, uh, today. But I wanted um, my task, I guess, at the outset is just to highlight something that we, the board has been doing um, beginning last month. We created a board uh, nomination process. Uh, Catherine Marr, who will be coming in, and Elaine Westbrooks uh, from the University of North Carolina, uh, who can't join us, formed a, along with Denise, a board nominating committee. Um, it's the first time we've done that in a while as we think about the long-term growth of the organization. Um, and, you know, as an organization that was built out of community and community conversations, we thought it was important as we're growing the owners of the organization, which is the board, to make that an open an open call. So in May, we ran an open process um, soliciting nominations, self nominations and others. Uh, we received over three dozen nominations. Um, it's a strong group. It's a combination of folks whom we've worked with and a handful of folks who uh, are new, would be newer to the DPLA community. Um, the committee met last week um, and to, to take a first pass through on the, on the nominations. Uh, next week, uh, the DPLA staff will begin to schedule meetings and, and um, next steps with potential candidates. Um, so if any of you, I saw some, some of you might be other, on that list, you can expect to hear from us soon. Um, the committee will then reconvene and then recommend to the full board a set of nominees over the summer. Um, and that's, you know, we, I'm really appreciative of how many folks raise their hands and are eager to be part of, part of this conversation uh, and part of this process and part of this community with us. Um, Catherine is here. So Catherine, I don't know if you wanna add anything else as the co-owner of the committee. Um, I think just, we're really looking forward to sort of what comes out of this. We've identified a strong slate of candidates. I think that John is in this problem. I know that John is in the process right now of speaking to folks to understand and ascertain their interest. And then we'll be going forward to interview um, at the board level to find the appropriate fit. And one of the things that I, I was really excited about in the conversation that um, we talked about at, at length and Delane and, and John and myself was also the opportunity to potentially uh, expand the board with an eye to bringing in folks who are more mid-career rather than sort of late career with the idea that it's a it's an exciting opportunity for us to have a different perspective and sort of as to where the field is going but really thinking about the opportunities too when we think about diversity across all the different lenses of what diversity looks like uh, knowing that as the field continues to change you know we're going to get strong young voices from across uh, geographic racial uh, ethnic various different sort of un understanding gender diversity um, and so you know really sort of keeping an eye as to what we can add from a whole different sort of set of perspectives right now um, through this process. And so I think that that's the, the one thing, John, that you didn't mention. And then of course, we're moving forward, should have everything um, underway through the summer and with the idea of looking to get folks in in the fall. So timely. 
Thank you. And I guess one note I would also add is, you know, as part of our board circle of life, we have two board members who are um, term limited out. Um, all of our board members are unique and bring unique set of qualities and are hard to replicate. I don't think it's an, a, a controversial fact to say Jennifer Aitley is particularly unique for the strengths and calibers uh, and backgrounds and experiences and networks and wisdom that Jenny, that you've brought to our work. I know for a fact that as we think about growing our work, you are on our list of folks to engage with, especially as the eBooks work grows. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we've joked like there's no there's no archetype, as you know well. You're, there's no Jello mode mold of Jennifer <laughs> Lee. So uh, thanks for everything you've contributed to DPLA over your <laughs> terms here. And um, you know, I, I, we're like I said, we're going to keep engaging you in the future. Mm. Thank you. Um, I feel engaged. Yes. <laughs> good. Good. Yeah. Don't go away. Don't Lar go away. So it is my job now to um, hand things over to my colleague, Shana Moraine, to really dive into the program today. We're really lucky to be able to go into depth into the work of our, of our um, national network. Um, Shana is our director of community engagement and our mover and shaker, our library journal, DPLA's very own library journal uh, mover and shaker. Um, and uh, exciting to hear what you have planned for the conversation, Shanae, over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everyone. Last month's member meeting themed ideas, building inclusion in a digital age, brought partners of DPLA's large and growing community together for hub updates and deep dialogue about the network's inclusion, diversity, equity, access, and social justice work. That's what the acronym IDEA stands for. The collective shared updates about how the last year transformed how hubs build community and shared local projects indicative of partners' courageous and responsible commitment to an authentic reckoning with our past and their active stance towards doing better for the future. Joining me for a conversation about building inclusion for 2021 and beyond are Tara Carlisle. Tara is the DPLA Advisory Council Chair. She's from the OK Hub and is currently head of digital scholarship of the Digital Scholarship Lab at the University of Oklahoma Libraries. Kinza Masood is the DPLA Network Council Co-Chair director of the Mountain West Digital Library and Research Association Librarian at the University of Utah's Marriott Library. So to kick things off, uh, Tara, both this is for both of you, Tara, you can start us off. What were your impressions and reflections as council chairs and organizers, both of you um, being on the planning committee, what were your impressions of this year's members meeting? Well, after, um, well, thank you. First of all, thank you. It's, it's so wonderful to be joining um, and being, um, be able to feel welcome with, you know, being able to um, talk with the board members and we really appreciate this opportunity. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, for this invitation. Um, members Day was like none other, I think for all of us, because we were reflecting on um, a, a difficult year, a challenging year. Um, and this was a time, however, that we really focused on celebrating our great successes and the progress that we made and our persistence and stick to itiveness. Um, we were able to kind of um, acknowledge, and one of the ways we did that was we invited member hubs to contribute a slide. We had a slide deck, we did kind of lightning talks and, and each of those slides really kind of highlighted areas that they were working on that each of the hub progressed and also implemented, walked the walk, to, you know, were able to implement ideas work. Um, and so to us, it proved that we're building a, an intentional community, a community that is focused on really impacting and, and making change. So um, I think that was, the takeaway in terms of reflection that we really have kind of have a collective effort, have made a collective effort. And I think we have a common vision. It's, it's really concerted and it, it, was, it was gratifying to see that. Thank you, Tara. Kenza, can you tell us a bit about how the agenda for the meeting was informed? 
Yeah, and thank you so much for the introduction. And also, again, as Tara said, the opportunity to be here to talk to you, all of you guys. Um, so the Members' Day meeting, as Tara mentioned, was different this year, but we had some really good and rich conversations. Um, over the past year, we've worked through a number of challenges with the Hub Network um, and also talking with the DPLS staff, Advisory Council, and some of them we have worked through um, have been resolved and st some are still in the process of resolving, but we believe that we've made pretty good progress by implementing new initiatives such as working on communication and transparency between network as a whole. Um, and again, between the network council, advisory council, and DPLA staff, the dialogue between the network council, the network, the DPLA, and the working groups has also improved. Um, and it's really nice that we've had the opportunity to have that um, conversation and uh, more a better connection with the board as well. And the working group directions have uh, we've been trying to address those to a degree with the help of the direct com communication we've been talking about. And we've kind of looped the feedback that we had um, sent out through a survey to the network into what drove some of the agenda of the network council, uh, the members in meeting, uh, and which was really great. Um, we have been, uh, people have been really appreciative of the open communication through the brown bag series, uh, the coffee chats um, with the network council chairs and DPLA staff. And again, that communication with allowing the working group members to attend the advisory council meetings, the network council, and also the board engagement uh, commitment as well. And, um, I, I think we've made great progress. And again, the working groups have also, uh, we've addressed their charge. Um, they've been updated and we've been um, talking to them pretty frequently about the direction and how to move forward. And so the agenda was pretty much driven around, of course, the EDI um, uh, efforts and the idea statement that have been published recently but also I think the network as a whole appreciates that transparency, the effort behind that transparency in the communication mm -hmm. as a whole. Thank you, Kenza. Speaking of progress, where is the network going in 2022? How have the priorities of 2021 grown and shaped new network driven projects and initiatives? Tara, let's start with you. Okay. Um, well, two of the parties, it, priorities set by the advisory council as, as chair was we, we wanted to focus on communication, increasing communication, and uh, Kinza has addressed that and how um, DPLA staff and, and members have really come together to make that happen in, in a variety of multi-channel ways. And um, so that with that feedback, positive feedback that we've gotten, we'll continue that and we'll continue to tweak that. So we've realized that you know, such a simple thing is really has powerful results and, and communication being really focused and dedicated to transparency and open communication is, is so important for, for such a diverse set of um, wide ranging um, set of members. The other priority item um, that we focused on that is representation opening up um, our offices and our working groups and our participation, um, bringing in more voices, being more inclusive, um, having greater representation, and whether it's early career or a full range of, 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 of people that we want to bring in and, and get their point of view and, and have them represented. So, um, very specifically, what the advisory council did was form a task force to, to take a look at its operating principles. And they're going to provide recommendations um, in July on, on how to, maybe to change um, and to amend our operating principles initially, you know, just right off the bat, but also to kind of rethink um, possibly membership as well. So right now they're um, reviewing the governance documents. Um, they will make recommendations that will impact our elections. Um, and, and hopefully as you know, we're talking that walking the walk is really making concrete changes 
to, to, to open opportunities for others to join um, the conversation. So um, our election process is coming up at the end of the summer, early fall, and we hope to have that um, framework in place for our elections. Thank you, Tara. Um, I, I heard coming out of that uh, a lot of intentionality around policies and practices. Kenza, how has the network's focus on ideas impacted your hub and local leadership and policies and practices? Like as network council chair, what have you learned as a leader and brought back to your hub? Yeah, I would say um, mostly, and I'm looking at my notes, um, I think some of the things that really have helped in just gathering the larger feedback collectively from the network as a whole, and then um, outlining the idea statement and publishing that um, and getting the feedback back from the network and understanding that there's a lot of support in wanting to implement that. But some of the challenges that we hear our uh, network talking about, um, especially in the pandemic and hopefully post pandemic, but still in certain times is that, um, you know, hiring challenges, especially um, where a lot of us are working with smaller, less resource institutions. MWDL is also a very lean organization, but um, our metadata librarian, Teresa Hebron, she's currently co-chairing uh, with Penelope Schumacher from the Ohio Digital Network. And they've done some great work in the DPLA metadata working group. And we've been publishing that work um, in promoting the harmful language statement and talking about other related challenges, especially from an EDI perspective. So what I've learned is that we are um, all willing to, as Tara said, what, walk the talk. <laughs> um, and we have been promoting through our virtual conferences and hub meetings um, that this is what, you know, where we're going and how we're moving forward. And we have the support, but I think the resource, the lack of resources um, and also financial instability in a lot of our hubs, especially our smaller hubs is a, a bit of a concern. And I think that's something that we can look into. Also the Marriott Library hosts the Mountain West Digital Library. And um, since we've been promoting the idea statement, I was approached by the Marriott Library um, and they've hired a new curatorial position who's working to look at diversifying physical and as an extension also the digital collections. So we're looking to develop a, a database or a libguide based around the principles of DEI in partnership with the Merit Library and also then um, kind of reaching out to the MWDL community and then I think it will filter back into the larger DPLA community. And then MWDL has also been working with a faculty member at Utah Valley University to develop an educational toolkit using MWDL resources that will be used in, they are being used in K2 through 12 classrooms already. And now we're beginning to also look to migrate our discussions to possibly include resources that will incorporate an EDI focus within the toolkit. And I think also, as Tara mentioned, with, with looking at the new um, elections coming up, it'll be good to, um, look at diversifying the pool um, in the network council governance. Thank you, Kenza. Tara, do you wanna answer that? What have you brought back to the OK Hub and what have you learned as a leader? You know, very specifically, um, <clears throat> I have to say just, just quickly, the breakout sessions were, were really exciting to see the initiatives, the work of aggregation and digital curation. And I, and I got that sense of excitement from the members. And we really appreciate the efforts of DPLA staff and in, in responding to, to that feedback. Um, so it's, it's exciting. Um, specifically closer to home, I, the ways that we have implemented, um, one example is the University of Oklahoma Libraries formed a working uh, group of metadata justice. And as part of their work, they submitted a proposal to the Library of Congress to change the subject term Tulsa Race Riot to Tulsa Race Massacre which obviously has a, it's a substantial difference. Um, it took months for that work to get done, um, but we're very proud of that it happened. It is now officially a subject heading. It's the Tulsa Race Massacre. 
so this is is you know a a, a big step um, and and one way of, of kind of following through um, on our word and and feeling that we can contribute to that larger mission. Um, what I have learned is the importance of remaining true to the, our mission and the strategic plans. And in doing um, that, making sure our members feel empowered to determine how they can contribute to the, to the mission in their way um, and to implement that. And so in some cases, I mean, that requires an open mind because ideas that maybe you know, some of us had not thought of, but others have being open to those ideas and thinking about, you know, let's explore this. Let's see how we can um, take your idea and see if we can implement it in, in these other ways or apply it in these other ways. So as a leader, I've learned to um, the importance of um, sticking to our mission, sticking to our priorities, having to make the difficult decision as we, keep, we don't have time to work on all of these. We have to focus on some very, two very important ones and we'll determine that these are the two very important ones. Um, and then, um, you know, making that happen as best as we can, achieving some progress. So, thank you. Thank you, Kenza and Tara, uh, for being our network leaders this year. We've learned with you all and from you all so much from your, from your work. Um, and your input and, and guidance has been crucial for getting the idea statement and embedded in all of our work to really truly build collaborative digital initiatives. You all have, um, you all as leading the network have, have stuck a, a, a stake in the ground around what it means to be ethical and how we do our project design. And also you all have contributed to how we, how we as a network consider assessment and that we're checking our work and we're making sure that we are centering the identities of marginalized groups and smaller institutions. So it is great to uh, hear from you all, uh, your impressions of the members meeting. Um, thank you for being with us again this afternoon. Thank Next you, Shane. Th thank you for your leadership, Shane. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you dropped, Shanae, you dropped out. Hello. Very good. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, next, we'll hear from DPLA's Director of Technology, Michael Delavita, developer Audrey Altman, and Jackson Hong of the University of Michigan Library about our efforts to advance the work of algorithmic justice in the DPLA network. Michael, over to you. Thanks, Shanae. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Over the past year, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, DPLA has put a lot of thought into how we will pursue our goals of equity and inclusion, which are pillars of our organizational strategy. We've taken a long, hard look at the systems and policies that we've built at DPLA and how we can improve them to increase representation in our communities and collections. For too long, the library sector has relied on non-commercial missions and good intentions in place of ensuring positive outcomes for underrepresented groups. This problem extends all the way from the decisions made at acquisition through to systems of search and discovery, and also involves the partnerships and funding models that undergird these processes. We know that the systems that we have built and envision building in the future are capable of reflecting and amplifying the background radiation of bigotry and racism that colors the history of this country, extending to present day. DPLA, along with our partners, has plans and aspirations to be part of the solution to these issues. One place we feel like we have an important role is in examining and improving the policy systems and algorithms that libraries and archives and museums use to present their collections online and make them discoverable. Today, I'm happy to present Audrey Altman, a software engineer at DPLA, to talk about some of our latest thinking along these lines. We are also lucky to be joined today by a colleague of Audrey's. Jackson Huang is the director, the digital collections coordinator at the University of Michigan Library. They wrote their master's thesis about representations of Chinese Americans in digital libraries and metadata records and the ways that that representation changes when materials are aggregated into large collections such as Calisphere and the DPLA. So I'm gonna pass the mic over to Audrey to get us started. Audrey? Hi y'all, um, I have some slides, so bear with me for just a sec while I share them for you. Um, okay. 
Oops, that's the wrong kind of sharing. I'm trying to do presenting. There we go. Can everybody see that okay? I'm gonna, I'm, yes. <laughs> okay, good. Who's you can't say, see us, but we're, we're all nodding. Every dozens of people are nodding. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, okay, so uh, we've been calling this unofficially, I may be officially, I don't know yet. Unofficially, we've been calling this project the Algorithmic Justice Project. Um, and as uh, Michael said, um, the three of us are going to talk today. There's me, um, Michael, who you just heard from, and Jackson, who you'll hear from next. Um, so the core question that we're trying to answer with the Algorithmic Justice Project is, can we make information retrieval more inclusive? Um, and we have several points of inspiration for this project. Um, the first one was uh, rooted in our experience making the Black Women's Suffrage Digital Collection, um, which if you haven't heard about, it's great. You should mosey on over to the website and check it out. It is a special sort of sub collection of the um, whole DPLA aggregation that is specifically focused on Black women's contributions to voting rights movements in the history of the United States. Um, and I worked really closely with Shane and Kat um, to do the curatorial work for this collection. And one of the things that we found while doing the curatorial work was that finding materials about Black women was really, really difficult for a myriad of reasons. It was very hard to find this information. Um, and obviously, if it was hard for us, a bunch of like trained librarians to find this information, then it's probably even harder for people who are coming to our websites to find this information. So um, that was sort of the root inspiration for this project was um, this experience in the Black Women's Suffrage Project. Um, and we've also been drawing inspiration from some people in our communities who have been doing some really good intellectual work around this. For example, Safaya Noble, um, who talks about technology as a social construct in her book, Algorithms of Oppression. She specifically looks at things like search results pages and um, an analyzing a search results page and approaching it as a cultural artifact and something that has meaning and that shares information and that reveals um, assumptions about um, the people who are being represented in the underlying collections. So it's really great work. If you haven't read it, um, I would encourage you to check it out. Um, we've also drawn inspiration from Ethan Zuckerman's book, Mistrust. Um, and he talks about how when institutions are failing, then we need to reinvent them. And if we think about information retrieval as an institution um, and the fact that it is not currently as representative as we would like it to be, um, then we need to give ourselves permission and empower ourselves and our communities to reinvent those systems. Um, and we also had in conjunction with, we, um, we did a book talk on this book and in conjunction we had um, a great conversation between Ethan Zuckerman and Catherine Marr and Catherine Marr made a very inspirational point about Wikimedia Foundation and how um, they take the attitude that you can't assume that their users will come to them already trusting them to provide good, accurate information that we as information institutions have to earn that trust. So one of the ways that we feel like we really need to be trying to earn the trust of our users is to address this issue of representation um, and to make sure that um, all of the communities that our collections are about are being reflected in a more fair way. So when we're talking about algorithms, um, there's a lot of different ways that algorithms are at work in an information retrieval system. I've thrown up some examples here. Um, so for example, when a user comes to a digital library and puts in a keyword search, there are algorithms in the background that are doing things like selecting what materials are going to be shown to that user, how they're going to be ranked, how they're going to be presented. Um, algorithms could also do things like recommend related content or related words or in terms that you can search for, um, suggesting ways to revise your search and providing different types of contextual information. Um, and then another thing that algorithms are doing um, in the sort of pre-processing part of an, of an information retrieval system. So what we would call our ingestion system, um, you're defining data structures, you're doing different enrichments to the data, you're organizing the data, and all of those things are gonna impact the way that users can actually find and interact with the data. So when we're talking about algorithmic justice, we're talking about all of these different possible pieces and algorithms that are working together to create a user experience. 
Um, and we also are trying to think about algorithms in context because of course algorithms don't live in a little silo by themselves. Our technologies are always in context. So in addition to looking at you know, the code and the math and all of that stuff, um, we're also looking at how they interplay with our collections, our metadata, our different user groups, our user interfaces, um, the different people and institutions who are involved in creating the collections, creating the algorithms, um, and then also um, looking at our history and culture because the, the collections that we have reflect history and culture. And, you know, as Michael pointed out, if there are, um, if, you know, if there's biases and racism and other isms in our history, then they show up in our collections and then they show up in our digital library experiences. So all of this is interconnected um, in very, very interesting, complex ways. And we're trying to look at the, the big picture. Um, and in terms of how we're approaching this work, I mean, we're very early um, sort of deciding what this work is gonna be and what it looks like. Um, but some of the pieces of the puzzle that are coming together are um, investigation, meaning looking at our own systems and figuring out where the pain points are, where the problems are in our own systems. Um, education, meaning trying to learn from experts in the field, trying to learn from underrepresented communities and trying to figure out how we can better share information with each other. Um, we're looking at our community. We want to make sure that the right people are involved, that we have a diversity of voices and expertises at the table. So we're thinking about how to build out that community. Um, and then experimentation, um, trying and testing out different ideas, seeing what actually happens when we try and put some of these ideas um, into our code base, um, iterating, testing, auditing, and then eventually, hopefully, getting to a point where we can all have better information systems. So that's it for me, and I am going to pass the mic over to Jackson. Okay, I have some slides as well, so give me a second just to put those up. Uh. <laughs> How do I make it full screen? Give me one second. Okay. How does that look to people? Someone will have to unmute themselves. That's okay. great. Okay. So uh, I'm going to be presenting a bit on a case study that I examined for my master's thesis when I was in the School of Information. Uh, it's I was interested in how digitization and the ingest across platforms uh, affects not only, it's not just a te technical decision, but it kind of shapes how users are able to find and make sense of materials. I was interested specifically in how this played out around collections related to marginalized communities, um, because oftentimes those digital collections have had special care and kind of intention to do some historical reparative work. Uh, and in particular, the case study that I'm looking at is a uh, collaborative collection called Chinese in California, which is on the history of Chinese immigration to California in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So before I go a little bit, go too far into my case study, I wanna talk a little bit about the framework from which I approach this work. So I came into libraries because of metadata, huge nerd, uh, but also I was really interested in metadata because of the way that it is integral in digital environments for users to be able to find and make sense of materials. I think unlike in physical environments in which users can, can browse, that's not really an option, especially in kind of large scale uh, platforms like DPLA. Um, and so I was very interested in how metadata, which gets thought of oftentimes as very technical or in a kind of narrow sense of like one specific keyword, how does metadata translation as a whole affect meaning how does it shape how users you know not only find material but understand what they're looking at so a little bit about what i mean by the phrase semantic harm um, i threw up a quick definition here on the right um, when i use the word semantic harm i really want to emphasize that this is the exclusion not just of individual perspectives but kind of ways of thinking there's kind of a historical exclusion and ongoing exclusion of whole classes of people and their worldviews. So in libraries and archives and academic contexts in general, what you see is that certain communities get cast as the subjects rather than agents of knowledge. People study you, you do not do the studying. Uh, this denial of subjectivity to certain communities causes semantic harm, not only to that community themselves, 
but to everyone in general, because by limiting those perspectives from being able to enter knowledge production, it prevents how it, it kind of shapes how knowledge currently exists and also what knowledge can be created in the future. And so what you'll see, you know, in libraries and archives is that there's not a lot of material on certain topics. But I think moreover, what you'll notice when you look a little deeper is that that material exists, but the description or the metadata is inaccurate. So there might be derogatory language or euphemistic language that covers up harm. There might be kind of reductive description where ethnicities that are not the same ethnicity are grouped together or that uh, I, that individuals from marginalized groups are misidentified because people made like an assumption that people look the same um, or things might just be plain incorrect, right? So like in that case, if someone's misidentified, that's not just reductive, it's also just wrong. That's not the correct label for that particular person. Or if a particular community is labeled incorrectly, it's also just inaccurate metadata, right? It is racist, but it's also from a kind of metadata quality standpoint, just incorrect. Um, and this is especially harmful in archival spaces because of, I think, this perceived evidential nature of records. We kind of understand archival records as, you know, a record of fact. And so if you're not there, you don't exist. If it represents you a certain way, that's that's what's true and that gets used as justification for policies and things like that so looking a little bit about looking trying to find chinese materials in dpla um, if you do a quick search i use chinese just to kind of keep it broad uh, what you see on the first page are these kind of anonymous results right because a named chinese person is going to have the title of the item be the person's name. And so that's not gonna come up under a search for Chinese. It might, if that's in the subject headings, um, I'm not sure exactly how the algorithms prioritize item name versus subject headings versus descriptions. But you'll see that you know in the first page in general, items that have that keyword in the title are kind of prioritized. This is a little bit of an older result, but if you look at it now, it's, uh, it's very similar. And what's interesting that you'll note here is that none of the items on this page draw from the Chinese in California virtual collection. That's my case study example. So if you were to click on one of these items and go through to the collection that that item was from, it would be quite difficult to find more material that was kind of related to Chinese history. So the collection that is looking at itself, the Chinese in California virtual collection, is the only Chinese American archival collection that's been digitized in its entirety that I could find. So there have been items from other collections that have been digitized for online exhibits, but there aren't really any other whole collections that were available for me to do any sort of comparative work. I think that is kind of telling in and of itself. I originally had a lot of optimism that I would be able to find more cases because I figured that Chinese Americans are a relatively old community in the US, also a community with relative wealth. Um, but the fact that there was only one, I think, is quite telling here. So the collection itself, uh, like I said, is a topical collection. It was digitized in the late 90s as part of the Library of Congress Ameritech American Memories Project. Uh, it was spearheaded by the Bancroft Library, which is a special collections library at UC Berkeley. And it has materials from two UC Berkeley institutions as well as the California Historical Society and the Oroville Chinese Temple. So you'll see kind of insider and outsider perspectives. The academic libraries are kind of, or the Bancroft and the California Historical Society have more outsider perspectives and the ethnic studies library and the Oroville Chinese Temple have more insider perspectives. Um, this collection is available through a variety of different platforms, um, some of which provide collection level information and some of which only collect item or only allow for item level information. So this is kind of just going to be an examination of what happens when materials go from collection level to item level repositories, which I think in general thinks of is thought of again as a kind of like technical limitation. Um, so this is the original project website for the project. Uh, it's quite clear that it is from the late 90s, um, but it's quite explicit about the archival decisions. And so if you read some of the description, it's explicit that some of these portrayals are derogatory. It kind of contextualizes those derogatory materials, both in the history of the time, but also in kind of the history of collecting institutions. It acknowledges that a lot of the materials that are from 
insider perspectives come from the ethnic studies library, which I think is a very interesting and important kind of highlighting of how the question of who, you know, collects materials shapes what kinds of materials are collected. And something to know as well is that the material from the Oroville Chinese Temple uh, is not included in this particular website. It was kind of a later edition um, and it's kind of special information. Um, so the Oroville Chinese Temple is an actual temple and they designed a special website so that you can go through the rooms and look at the different artifacts that are in each room. Pretty cool, um, but there wasn't necessarily thought given to how to integrate the special information that's in that website to the main website or what would happen or how to put it into the finding aid or what would happen once the finding aid uh, went into an aggregate repository. So it wasn't an intentional oversight, but there are kind of consequences uh, in terms of loss of information to the fact that that kind of specialized capability wasn't really translated technically into uh, the other aggregators. So the project website itself is just a website. It doesn't really give you the, inf it doesn't give you uh, the items themselves or really the series organization. It's kind of just like a macro level explanation of the project and of the archival logic um, behind the project. So on OAC, there is a finding aid. Uh, the finding aid gives some really interesting contextual information for the collection, but not as much as the project website. And it organizes, it shows the materials in thematic organization. So one of the interesting things that you'll see there is that in the finding aid, materials are organized by source collection. So because this is a thematic collection, it's drawn from a lot of different archival collections. And uh, some of the, so there's some additional information that's about the source collection the materials are drawn from. You can see that in the example here that the scope and content note and subject indexing terms applies to all of the items that are drawn from that particular collection. Uh, what you'll notice though, or what you may be thinking about is that if the, if Calisphere and DPLA don't allow for hierarchical description or you know the inheritance of metadata fields because it's strictly item level, what happens when information is information is only given at the source collection level, right? What happens to how users are able to understand the materials when it goes into an item level repository? So the chart here uh, is kind of a breakdown of whether there is description or subject access for materials from each of the institutions. Uh, what you'll see is actually that the loss of contextual information is concentrated or more severe for institutions that were intentional about providing more context. So the ethnic studies library, which had the most archival collections that were from within the community rather than having subject files, uh, they had made it an intentional decision to provide subject access and scope and content notes at the source collection level for all their items. So what you see now is that in CDL or DPLA, actually none of their items have any subject or scope and content description. Um, similarly, like I said, with the Oroville Chinese Temple, because a lot of that information was kind of put in a separate website, when the finding aid went into OAC and the items went into Calisphere and DPLA, again, there isn't really any subject or there's no subject access or description. That's not to say that information was never gathered, but that in this kind of technical transformation across platforms, it was lost because it wasn't able to be ingested at that level. What's interesting too, is that you'll see that the Bancroft and California Historical Society have relatively less metadata loss um, and that these are more outsider perspectives. So thinking a little bit about why this matters, uh, a kind of concrete example here is here's an item called the Wildcat from the California Historical Society. You can see that there was relatively little loss of subject and location information. It's relatively unscathed. But what you don't see is that it's from a series called Cal San Francisco Chinatown Outsiders Looking In. That title already gives you some useful context, right? That this information was either created by outsiders or by Chinese Americans portraying their community in a specific way, maybe for tourism. This specific subseries, uh, from the source collection is called Photos Number Six Tradesmen, which seems pretty innocuous. 
But what you'll see is that that source collection, San Francisco Chinatown by Arnold Genth, uh, has other series whose names seem less innocuous, right? So photos number one, camera shy Chinese, has items such as fleeing from the camera, an unsuspecting victim, or no likey, which, you know, implies that these images were taken without consent or perhaps against the consent of its subjects, and in fact seems to actively fetishize their distress. So that really helps you contextualize that this outsider view of Chinatown isn't just a neutral one, but a specific and culturally informed perspective that kind of portrays Chinese people as exotic or other. So even though in DPLA you get the same image and you might even see the subject access points and you know, location information, because the context, because you lose that contextual meaning, how a user is able to understand this is completely different, right? They don't have historical context for the materials and finding their way back to that information is quite difficult. And there's not really any warning for them to prepare themselves for potentially challenging or sensitive content, which kind of brings me back to my original point, right? That technical decisions are actually deeply meaningful decisions. Uh, so what we see here is that what gets thought of as, you know, that technical translation, what metadata can be ingested to various platforms actually really shapes the meaning of the items. How does the metadata provide context and how does that context shape meaning? And so I think it's really important for us to think about how this plays out for materials that are related to marginalized communities. Uh, and I just wanna be clear that I'm not saying that collections like this shouldn't go into aggregate repositories, right? But rather to kind of challenge us to think more deeply about how to make sure that the care and intention that goes into reparative and historical correctives are not lost in technical translation. So that collections like this can also take full advantage of the potential for increased access that these large scale platforms provide, right? That it's not just the responsibility of curators or subject specialists to kind of like make these histories known, but for people who work in technical areas or systems design, how do we think about making sure that our platforms deal with all kinds of information in a way that is accurate and humanizing. So here's my little last slide. Um, I have put mine and Audrey's contact information up. If you want to read my thesis in its entirety, there's a link there. Um, there's some more kind of specific information in terms of like nitty gritty metadata analysis stuff. Um, and I think otherwise, uh, we and Audrey had a couple of questions for each other. So if you wanna come back on, Audrey. Yeah, hi, thanks, that was great. Um, actually, before I jump in with my questions, I'm just like, so Jackson and I are um, friends and could talk about this for ages just between ourselves. But before we jump in and do that, because it might just get a little bit like, us being excited. Does anybody else have any questions that they want to um, ask? If you don't, that's fine. And if you do, you could um, either unmute yourself or pop it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, but I want to make sure that y'all can also participate in this conversation and that it's not just going to be me and Jackson nerding out about metadata. I mean, which it will be, but you can also feel free to join us and nerd out about metadata and ask questions too. I don't see any like anybody jumping out yet. So if you're still thinking and wording your question, then that's great. Keep keep thinking and wording and drop it in whenever you feel like it. Um, so Jackson, oh God, I don't even remember. I mean, we have like a list of questions for each other. I'm not gonna remember where to start. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you a new question, haha, -ha, that you haven't seen before because I thought of it right before this. If we were going to, if you had the power to redesign an information retrieval system for an aggregation like DPLA, like from the top um, and do whatever you wanted and you had total freedom and like a hundred techies to work for you. What are some things that you would wanna make sure were happening in that system? I, I have an answer to this question that's a little bit more about how that system would get designed, mm -hmm. right? Which is that I think oftentimes when we talk about community participation, it's kind of like after the fact, right? It's like, We've had this platform, um, what works for you, what doesn't. Um, I think what I would say is that if you're gonna design a new system, I would really want 
there to be intention paid into what the purpose of the system is, right? Because I think that oftentimes there's kind of this dream of access where it's like more access is good or like more access is freedom, right? Um, and I obviously think that access is important, but I think that uh, this kind of default assumption that like putting information just like out there is the best way doesn't necessarily pay attention to the historical ways that information has been gathered non-consensually in certain communities or kind of just issues around, yeah, like this, the sovereignty of that information. Um, and so I think what I would say is that if there's a new platform, I would want to be really intentional about like what the purpose of the, inf of the system is, right? Like not just like, is this books or is this archival material, mm -hmm. but like, who is this for? And I, and I don't want the answer just to be everybody. Not that the answer can't be everybody eventually, but I think everybody is a very, like that's not really a useful answer. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I would want to have kind of community voices be part of the design process itself, right? Because I think that some of what I was highlighting here in terms of the fact that collection level metadata isn't available in DPLA, like I don't think that's necessarily bad. Mm -hmm. I think that there are advantages to like why there's a reason why finding aids are formatted the way they are and like why you know dpla doesn't take finding aids i think that that's all fine but i think that this kind of question of do we take finding aids or not like that question has to be discussed not just like technically but with essentially like that goal of what is the purpose of this platform and who do we see using it I don't know if you have thoughts on that, Audrey. I assume you are doing some system redesign and so that's something you that as well. <laughs> yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect. And I think I, I think it's interesting, like you've used the terms freedom a couple times, like freedom, information being out there. And I think it's really interesting to think about like when I was in like back when I was in library school, like 10 years ago, um, I remember that there was, uh, we had conversations about you know, when you get to a digital library and you have the ability to do this sort of like item level searching and, um, you know, that that's really freeing for the user because the way that you organize and describe information is um, like that is information in and of itself. And when you when you take that like sort of context away and let people do all this like reorganizing items. Um, then that's somehow like freeing for them because then they have the power to like articulate new stories with items because they're no longer like strictly in this hierarchical organizational collection. Um, and, and like, I don't remember us being like all super gung-ho about it when we were like in library school. Um, and, and now after being at DPLA for a while, I feel like that's true, but it's also true that what you're saying is, is you know, something is lost when you do that. And that the work that people have done to organize and describe is, you know, it, it, like freedom with freedom comes a, a lot of responsibility and the people, people don't have the power to go and learn the entire history of how, organ, how institutions collected things and organize them and why. So yep. providing that is really important too. I, I think that point that you're making about the relationship between freedom and responsibility is also really important, right? Because it's it's good to have flexibility for users to be able to build their own collections. But I think that oftentimes freedom becomes a way for institutions to essentially absolve themselves of responsibility, right? Like now that the users have the freedom, like we don't have to have the responsibility to, you know, make sure that it's actually organized in a specific way because it's like well now everyone can be their own catalogers but there's also a reason why catalogers are a profession right there's like a reason why there are you know as problematic as professionalization in the field can be like there requires certain kinds of specialized knowledge to be able to navigate certain kinds of systems and so i think it's important yeah again not that freedom isn't good sometimes but that like we can't let it be an excuse essentially for us to absolve ourselves of our professional and technical responsibility as people who like create and build infrastructure. Okay. okay, I'm getting the hook. So I think it's time for us to pass the mic. Thank you so much, Jackson. That was really fun. And if anyone wants to continue the conversation with us, then just drop us an email and we'll be happy to, to chat more and to get you involved in whatever the next steps are going to be on this project. Wow. I mean, wow. Thanks, you guys. I mean, you know, freedom can't be an excuse. Um, I'm so grateful 
to you, Jackson, to Tara, to Kinza, um, for joining us and that the board and the larger community have got a slice of the community we get to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm also really glad y'all got to hear from some of our colleagues um, and got to hear a little bit of what the privilege it is for us on the DPLA side. Um, to wrap up, I just am gonna point and uh, my colleague Kat might do a rapid round of, of links just to highlight a couple of things that you know, we've been uh, some points that have gone up on the board between what the staff's been driving and the larger community. Um, last month, we launched our newest hub in our national network with the Northwest Digital Heritage Hub. So congratulations to everyone in the Northwest who helped take that on. Um, also yesterday, we announced a big uh, uh, upload of 50,000 materials from our partners, the Orbis Cascade Alliance. Um, and depending how fast Kat is, uh, is Google jockeying, she'll, she'll share that link. Um, many of you saw the news and talked about and shared the news um, earlier this spring of the um, agreement we announced with Amazon Publishing to make their 10,000 eBooks and audiobooks available. You know, that's part of our intentional effort to make sure that libraries have the flexibility and freedom they need to, to ensure that digital materials are available to their patrons and their readers. Um, that work un, under the leadership of our colleague, Michelle Kimpton is continuing and going to grow. Um, and I think, you know, we're actively in communication and listening to our partners on the ground and we'll be tweaking and, and building our project to ensure that we're serving the needs of what we're hearing from libraries. Um, and, and so stay tuned for more news about that. And thank you to Michelle for really just, you know, pushing a really exciting kind of next step for the entire field. Um, last bit before I hand it over to you, Denise, to close us out, um, two events. We have, you know, we, even though it's summertime, we've got two big events this month coming up on, um, Audrey mentioned the first DPLA book talk. The second one we're doing on Thursday with Dr. Shonda Prescott-Weinstein and her book, The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time and Dreams Deferred. Kat's gonna throw the link in there. Uh, Dr. Prescott-Weinstein will be in dialogue with Lori Harris from the University of Cincinnati. That's Thursday afternoon. And this is an experiment we've started to do the DPLA book talks, but I think we're gonna keep them going. We wanna keep ideas and conversations going, not just about our work, but about new ideas. Lastly, um, on June 28th, uh, DPLA is partnering with Knight Foundation to convene a conversation of librarians and others about the role of libraries in securing and ensuring equitable broadband access across the country. Um, and so we've got a set of, of partners who are gonna be in conversation with us at that event, um, including Tracy Hall from ALA, um, John Palfrey, uh, DPLA, founder um, and um, uh, our very own uh, two, D two DPLA board members, uh, Jill Bourne and Felton Thomas will be there as well as Crosby Kemper, the director of, uh, of IMLS. So um, you can look for that link. We'll be pushing that out as well, but you can look for that in the chat. And those are our plans for the summer. We hope to see you either at the book talk or at the conversation about broadband access. Denise, I'll hand it over to you to, to bring us home. Well, uh, first, I want to echo our appreciation to our presenters today. I mean, we learned a lot about what's going on behind the scenes, but more importantly, about how we're trying to affect change. And that's enormously important. And it's, 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 it's evidently clear the role that we're playing in helping to ensure access not only to information, but to the truth about the information. This is really uh, very informative and I learned a lot. I uh, wanna thank everybody for joining us today. I had to, uh, you know, till before I adjourn, just wanna make sure we didn't have any last minute questions or comments or uh, suggestions before uh, we adjourn and allow people to get on to their next appointments. Hearing none, we are adjourned. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks everyone, have a great summer.
See you. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Denise.